Thank you, Russ. Take your Bibles and turn with me again tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And before I start, I want to uh, share something, and really I'm probably talking more to, to uh, Brother Gene and the deacons right now than anybody else, but this morning after church, <clears throat> I had a, a family come to the office, and they were just bubbling over with excitement and enthusiasm. And they said, we just want to introduce ourselves to you. Said, we've been coming to church here since Christmas. Said, we sat up in the balcony and said, we, we usually are gone and, and we hadn't got a chance to meet a lot of people. And said, we just want to come down and introduce ourselves, tell you how much we enjoyed coming to church. Well, they had, after they left, I went out to the hall, another man and woman standing there and said, can we talk to you just a minute? And I said, sure. They said, we've been coming to church here for about three or four weeks, and we just want to tell you how much we in, enjoy the church. What, what I'm trying to say is I believe a lot of our visitors are kind of falling through the cracks sometimes. And uh, I'd like to find a way that we could get to know the, the visitors and, and minister to them. So, uh, Gene, I, I was thinking this afternoon... Instead of giving out the visitors' packs, Floyd, like we do during visitation, why don't we just ask the, all of our visitors, maybe go across the hall for a few minutes after church on Sunday morning, about five minutes, and we can give them a visitors' pack, introduce ourselves to them, let them introduce our, themselves to us, and be a way to get to meet everybody and them get to meet us and, and uh, make sure we know them. Gene, you can ponder on that and the rest of you. And let me know what you'd do. If you don't want to do that, maybe you know something better we could do. But take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Just hold that place just a minute. You know, the Bible tells us that Joseph uh, supplied the tomb for Jesus' burial. The story was told one time that somebody pulled Joseph aside. And said, Joseph, do you know how much that tomb that you just gave away cost? Well, that is a beautiful, costly, hand-hewn tomb. Why on earth did you give it to somebody to be buried in? And Joseph's response was, he only needed it for the weekend. That's true, folks. Somebody sent me this today. It's called Mary Had a Little Lamb. You may have heard this. Mary had a little lamb who lived before his birth. Self-existent son of God from heaven he came to earth. Mary had a little lamb seeing him in yonder stall. Virgin born son of God to save men from the fall. Mary had the little lamb, obedient son of God. Everywhere the Father led, his feet were sure to trod. Mary had the little lamb crucified on the tree. The rejected Son of God, he died to set men free. Mary had the little lamb, men placed him in the grave. Thinking they were done with him, to death he was no slave. Mary had the little lamb, ascended now is he. All work on earth is ended, our advocate to be. Mary had the little lamb, mystery to behold. From the Lamb of Calvary, a line will unfold. When the day star comes again, of this you can be very sure. It won't be with a lamb-like silence, but with the lion's roar for sure. And all that is possible because the tomb is empty. We serve a risen Savior. I shared with you this morning... Uh, first part of this message about the, the resurrection. Tonight I want to share with you from verses 12 through 23 and share with you the benefits of, of, of the resurrection. When I went to Carson Newman Jim, I'd never heard this. Don't think I've ever heard it since. But I was going through New Testament survey and my teacher said, we're going to talk about a principle tonight that's called the full mention principle. Did you ever learn that, Jim? Okay, maybe this instructor, that's just one of his things. But he said the full mentioned principle in the Bible 
was when a chapter or a text takes a certain subject and expounds on it to the point that you get the full meaning of what it's talking about. An illustration would be 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where the subject of love is, is given the full treatment. Or in James chapter 3, where the tongue is addressed. Well, this principle would probably apply to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because here in this passage, the Apostle Paul addresses in great detail the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this doctrine is one of the most important doctrines in all the Bible. And I shared that this morning. Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we have no faith. And Christianity is no better than any other cult or false religion in the world. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ really did happen. And it happened just like the Bible says that it happened. And since the resurrection of Jesus Christ is real, what does it mean for us tonight? Well, the verses we're going to look at tonight, the Apostle Paul shares with us some benefits of the resurrection. And the first benefit of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is, folks, our faith is real. Our faith is genuine. Look in verses 12 through 19. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if Christ, the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. <clears throat> and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Paul's line of thinking in these verses is, if Christ is not risen, then. If Christ is not risen, then this is what you can expect. This are the circumstances that you find yourself in. And if you follow the Apostle Paul's logic to the logical conclusion, folks, you and I are facing some terrible circumstances tonight. If there be no resurrection from the dead, then our lives mean nothing. And I said this morning, we wasted our time getting out of bed. And we wasted our time coming to church tonight. Except for the fellowship that we're going to enjoy. But what Paul shows us in these verses, he says, I want to tell you what would be true if there was no resurrection. And then he says, but Christ is risen. So what does that mean to us? Verse number 13, he says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ is not risen tonight, folks, he died in vain. He suffered all that he suffered and experienced all that he experienced, and it was in vain. Not only that, if Christ be not risen tonight, he lied to us. If Christ be not risen tonight, he has no power to save us. He has no power to be our comforter. He has no power where it says, Yea, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be uh, afraid, not afraid, because the Lord's going to be there with me. We won't have that promise tonight if He be not risen. Verse number 14 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. If Christ be not risen tonight, folks, preaching is a waste of time. Teaching the Word of God is a waste of time. You and I can't help anybody by preaching. You and I can't help anybody by teaching. Verse number 14 also says that if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. Our faith is foolish. Everything we do as a Christian, all of our praying, all of our studying God's Word, all of our witnessing to other people, 
All of the hope that we have. All of the praising that we give to God. All that's just a waste of time. If Christ be not risen from the dead. And verse 15 says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not. If so be, the dead rise not. Listen, folks. If we don't serve a risen Savior tonight, you and I are false witnesses. If you and I don't have a risen Lord Jesus Christ tonight as our Savior, then you and I are liars because our testimony is not real. And verse 17 says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, yet ye are in your sins. Listen, if Christ be not raised from the dead tonight, every one of us are dead in our sins. Every one of us are lost and on the road to hell. And verse 18 says, Then they also which are asleep in Christ are perished. This is what breaks your heart. If Christ be not risen from the dead, those who have gone on before us are gone forever. They are all dead and in the ground and they have no hope. Verse number 19 also says, if in this life only we have hope, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Christ be not risen from the dead tonight, folks, then we're to be pitied as a people because we're all fools because we're building our lives and our hopes on a person who is dead. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to, to go to Russia. And uh, before we went down to the Crimea to do our crusade, we got to go to Red Square and take a tour of Moscow. And one of the things that the tour guide wanted to show us was this tomb. He wanted everybody to see this tomb. And he was so excited because inside this glass enclosed tomb was a body. The body of Joseph Stalin. And he was so excited that he could show us the body of his leader. Folks, listen. I don't want anybody to know that my leader is dead. I want everybody to know my leader is, leader is alive. I'm glad the tomb is empty. And Paul's announcement, after he said, if Christ be not risen from the dead, Paul says, but the message of the angels at the tomb was true. Christ is risen from the dead. Jesus did rise just as He said He would. Look in verse number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Paul says, listen, Jesus is alive. He said, by the power of God, Jesus conquered death and the grave and rose again from the dead. And according to the Apostle Paul, the first Adam brought death, but the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, brought life and salvation. Jesus rose from the dead and now He's the first fruits. <coughs> Think about what that means for a few minutes, folks. Because He lives tonight the graves of this world are going to give up the redeemed one of these days. When Jesus returns in all of His glory, those people that have gone on before us are not dead. Their bodies are asleep. Their souls are in heaven. And because Jesus lives, everything that was mentioned that we talked about a few minutes ago is not true. It says, if Christ be not risen, folks, there's no if to it. Christ is risen from the dead. And because He's risen, our preaching is not a waste of time. Our faith is not wasted. 
And we're not liars. And we're not lost. We're saved tonight. And one of these days, our departed loved ones that are in heaven, we're going to be reunited with them again. Now I want to share with you the benefit, another benefit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul lets us in on a truth. He says because of the resurrection, we got a brand new family tonight. You know the old family every one of us used to belong to, the old Adam, wasn't much of a family. I remember hearing W.A. Crestwell speak one time. And W.A. Cresswell said, every one of us before we were saved lived on the wrong side of the tracks. That's a good analogy. Spiritually speaking, every one of us were on the wrong side of the tracks. But because of the resurrection, we've got a new family that we can be a part of. Look in verse 24. <coughs> then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Do you notice what God's called in verse 24? The Father. He's our Father. And then if you go down in verse number 50, all the way over to verse number 50, it says in verse number 50, Now this I say, brethren, and then you look down in verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren. You know, if you got a family and your brethren, and even so far as to say beloved brethren, that sounds to me like somebody loves us and we're a part of a family. And that's exactly what happened when we trust Jesus Christ by faith. According to the Bible, we're born again. And we are part of a brand new family. What this means is when we trust Christ, listen, when we trust Christ, we are removed from Adam in whom we were born. And we were placed in the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we are born again. Folks, we have been placed in Christ. We, have, we are taken from the family of death and we're given a place in the family of life. We're given a place in a family of hope. When we used to live in a family of hopelessness. I'm glad tonight that we're a part of a, of a family. I'm glad tonight I'm a part of Highland Park Baptist Church family. But let me tell you something. I'm glad I'm a part of God's forever family. And then look in verses 51 through 52. 51 through 52. I think I preached from this one time and I told you I used this passage of Scripture when my papa Flick died because it says, <coughs> it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. And I, I said, that talks about my papa because my papa was steadfast, unmovable. He was stubborn. And he was stubborn. He was stubborn about his church. He was stubborn about a lot of things. And I could tell you a lot about that tonight. But he loved the Lord. In verses 51 through 52, this talks of a glorious event we call the rapture. <coughs> Verse 51 through 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Talking about those who are in the grave. In a moment in the twink of an eye the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. And so in this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Folks, this is talking about that moment in time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return in the clouds. And He's going to call His people home to be with Him. And in verses 53 through 56, Paul says, listen, 
It doesn't matter whether you meet the Lord in the clouds. It doesn't matter whether you're in the dirt or above the dirt. He says you're going to obtain victory over death either way. You know, I've shared this with you before. When Jesus comes again, take his church home, I'd either like to be standing in the pulpit or standing in a cemetery. And let me tell you why I want to be standing in a cemetery. When Jesus comes again, calls his people home, and all them graves start popping open, and you see those that are asleep in Christ and they're raised up, and there they're reunited with the soul that is already in heaven. And then we're standing there just like that. We see it happen. And then Jesus says, what are you waiting for? You all come on up too. Isn't that going to be great? Folks, one of these days, we're going to receive a new body. You know, these old bodies are bodies of sin and death. But one of these days, we're going to get a new body that's going to be filled with the glory of God. These bodies that you and I are wearing tonight are worthless. They've got no business in heaven. In fact, it would be impossible for these bodies to enter into that city. Do you know what would happen if we entered into heaven in these bodies and we got one glimpse of God in all of His glory? Folks, these bodies would just start disintegrating. They'd just start exploding. Wouldn't be able to take it. But one of these days... When our resurrected Redeemer returns in His glory, we're going to get a body that will enable us to see God and live with God. And we're not only going to be with Jesus when He returns, but we're going to be like Jesus when He returns. (coughs) And I like verse 57. It says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. But now listen. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that song say? You're a winner either way. Doesn't matter whether you're in the grave. Doesn't matter whether you're on top of the grave. If we face death and go to the grave, our souls are going to go and to be with the Lord. But when the Lord returns, He will bring our soul with Him. And He'll raise our old dead bodies. And He'll change it into a brand new body. And then He'll put that soul back in that brand new body. And He'll say, come on home. I've been waiting for you. Folks, He'll take the total package to heaven. A new body that our soul is going to live in forever. And if we're alive when Jesus returns, that's even better. Because we'll just get be caught up in the air with them. And I'm getting ready to say something, and if y'all go and tell my family I said this, I'm going to deny it, okay? (laughs) If Jesus comes and calls us all to heaven, it's going to save a lot of people a lot of money that they'd be spending on a funeral. (laughs) Because we won't have to have a funeral, folks. We won't, we'll we'll just go from right what we're doing into the presence of God. And then in verse number 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Listen to what it says. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Folks, we have an incentive tonight to labor for Jesus. Because whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to win the victory. Whether I live or whether I die, God's going to come and get me and take me home to be with Him. You see, folks, right now Jesus is in heaven. He's preparing a place for us. Aren't you glad that Jesus is alive tonight? That the tomb is empty tonight? 
Aren't you glad tonight that Jesus just needed that tomb for a weekend? Aren't you glad tonight that we've got a Savior in heaven who said, made a promise to us when we were saved? He said, I'm getting ready to go prepare a place for you. And as soon as I get it ready, I'll be back. So that you can spend eternity with me forever. Amen. Folks, we serve a risen Savior. Paul says, if Christ be not risen, then. But he also said, but Christ is risen indeed. We serve a Savior who's alive tonight. Let me ask you this. Is he alive in you? Is he? Has his resurrection become your resurrection? That resurrected power, folks, it's not just a power that's going to take us to heaven. It's a power for the here and now. Whatever we're experiencing right now. That's the power that Jesus said, I'll never leave you for nor forsake you. I'm always right there with you. That's the power that says, I can give you comfort like nobody else can give you. I can give you comfort that the world can't give you. That's the power that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let me ask you, is Jesus alive in you tonight? We ought to be able to say tonight, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Get us out of this old world. Get us out of this old mess. I was talking to a lady the other day, and she said, preacher, who are you going to vote for in the election? I said, well, I said, I don't like to talk politics. I said, right now, I don't know if there's anybody I want to vote for. And she said, I'm going to tell you what I'm praying for. I'm praying that the Lord will just come and get us and we won't even have to vote. <laughs> Folks, listen. One of these days, everything's going to be made brand new. Former things have passed away. What we worry about now, one of these days we'll never think about again. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that we serve a risen Savior. That the tomb is empty. And Father, we need that power tonight. Lord, your church needs that power tonight. Lord, we need the power tonight to be your witness and to be your light in a sinful, dark world. We need your power, Father, to go out and tell people the good news that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, and buried, but he's alive. Father, we need your power to live in a world that's getting harder and harder to live in as a Christian every single day. Father, that power is here tonight. All we've got to do is claim it. All we've got to do is use it. Father, if there's one here tonight who has never been saved, I pray tonight that open up their heart and ask you to come in, be their Savior and be their Lord. If you're here tonight and you know Jesus as your Savior, but you know that power is just kind of going unused in your life. Every day is a struggle. Every day it just seems like the Lord is just giving you a bigger mountain to climb. The Bible says if we have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, we can move those mountains out into the ocean because of the resurrected power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I don't know what you've spoken to the hearts that are in this place tonight, but I know your spirit is here. I know your presence is here, and I know your power is here. And I just pray you'd move us to be obedient to you tonight. <coughs> Father, as we were going over our prayer warrior, there were a lot of needs on our prayer warrior. Where the power of Jesus needs to be called down. And Father, I want to thank you tonight 
for the power of prayer as we pray for our nation. We pray for our nation's leaders. And Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be convicting some hearts and minds of some of our leaders right now of what's really right and what's really wrong. Father, bless this time of invitation as we come together. Your will be done in each and every heart and each and every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.